Hi, my name is Rob Sippel. I am the Geospatial and Numeric Data Librarian at Florida Tech's Evans Library. And I'm here today to record a workshop that I taught on February 17, 2022 on, uh, on an introduction to ArcGIS Pro. ArcGIS Pro being the latest generation of the Geographic Information Systems application that is marketed by the ESRI Corporation of, uh, I believe, Redlands, California. Uh, the workshop, as I taught it, consisted of two parts, an initial uh, lecture part describing a little, a little bit of background and theory behind GIS, um, followed by a hands-on workshop. Uh, this recording will cover the first part of that, the lecture part. It will not include the, the workshop because uh, that was um, a bit lengthy, and to record all that would result in a rather lengthy um, recording. So um, I will, however, provide my contact information uh, at the conclusion of this, of this recording, and I would be happy if you wish to provide you with any of the materials needed to do the hands-on exercise on your own. So uh, in case you are new to the subject of geographic information systems, which is usually just referred to as GIS, uh, it's a kind of um, a partnering up of data, uh, specifically what's known as geospatial data, with a relational database and maps. Um, so the uh, it's used for doing data visualization and analysis. Uh, the relational database, um, one example that comes to mind, and, and there are many examples on the market right now, but one example that comes to mind is uh, um, Microsoft uh, Access that comes as part of the Microsoft Office uh, suite of, of uh, applications. Um, geospatial data is uh, any data that is somehow a function of uh, geographic location on planet Earth. And uh, as I'll describe in some of the upcoming slides, that can take a variety of different forms. But at the heart of it, it's basically you've got a location and there is some kind of um, quantity or something you're measuring that applies to that location. And the mapping is simply maps, which I think most of you are probably familiar with and on some level. So uh, some example of where GIS can be used, which you probably want to know about. So you know why bother learning about this unless you have some sort of idea of what it's good for. Uh, so some examples are demographic demographic analyses. Uh, so for example, you might use um, GIS for uh, development programs related to uh, social welfare or community development. Um, it could be used for business development and marketing. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you had um, if you had a store you wanted to open up that sold uh, some kind of like a high-end product, for example, you might want to examine the income levels in various communities in which you might place this store to find places where people would be most likely to buy the product that you're planning on selling in your in your store. It's used in politics a lot. So uh, during uh, political campaigns, you'll often see these maps uh, with, uh, say, individual states colored as red or blue to indicate which way uh, their voting preferences tend to go in terms of uh, political party. Uh, those are known as coral plots, and I'll show you. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, you might use it for biological environmental research, so you might study where various um, animal populations exist or no longer exist, or uh, if there are um, pathways between various population bodies of a given species that will allow them to intermingle and not become inbred. Uh, you might use it also to see if. Um, the resources needed for a uh, certain animal to survive uh, exist in different places. Um, you can use it for transportation infrastructure planning. So, for example, uh, designing, designing or deciding where to put new highways or uh, rail links. Um, you, might, you might use it for that, for example. Uh, I used to work for an environmental engineering firm that used it a lot for environmental contamination remediation. So. They would uh, drill test wells in, a, in assorted of locations in areas that needed environmental cleanup. And uh, they would monitor the uh, contamination levels and water samples from those various wells over time to determine whether what they were doing 
to try to clean up the site was effective or not. Um, and so again, you've got you've got wells, you've got the location for those wells. That's the geospatial element of this, and you've got quantities associated with those locations, which in this case would be, say, parts per million of a certain chemical that you're concerned about. And um, another example is natural resource exploration. So, for example. Uh, the energy sector, oil companies will um, often use GIS to um, identify areas that have certain characteristics that are often associated with uh, deposits of oil. So um, I believe salt domes are often found in areas with petroleum deposits. So um, uh, a, an, an energy company might use that information to determine where they should concentrate their efforts as far as drill as far as drilling new test wells is concerned. Uh, so some examples here. Um, this is a, uh, a use of, um, of GIS for uh, weather, basically. This is a, a track of a hurricane back in 2004, Hurricane Ivan. And here in Florida, we, we spent a lot of time uh, studying and worrying about hurricanes. Um, in this particular area of, uh, of Florida, we have a lot of nesting grounds for sea turtles. So uh, this is a map that's tracking the migration patterns of a particular uh, sea turtle. Um, here we have something uh, which you will often find on, online. Different cities will sometimes post uh, crime gate data. Uh, so here is an example of an online uh, GIS application you could go to uh, for the city of, um, I'm thinking this is Jacksonville. Um, yes, it is. And you can kind of play around with their data and find out the extent to which various kinds of crimes occur in different neighborhoods in Jacksonville. Uh, so I mentioned before the use in, uh, in uh, politics. This is a coral pleth, which is basically a color-coded map um, showing voting patterns during the 2016 presiden presidential election. Um, an example of light pollution. Uh, if you were into uh, stargazing, for example, the, um, the the astronomy club here at Florida Tech uh, does a lot of um, little field trips to uh, to uh, kind of search out various uh, um, stars and other bodies in the night skies. Uh, they will try to find areas with a minimal amount of light pollution so that they can more clearly see the the objects, that they, the objects that they're targeting. So here's a map using GIS of light pollution. Uh, this is a very kind of localized use of GIS. This is a map of a mall. So what was done here was uh, they measured the levels of foot traffic uh, in different locations of the mall. So the areas here with um, more of a reddish color have high foot traffic. Uh, the areas that are more towards the blue end of the spectrum have low foot traffic. And uh, this was used to establish the pricing for um, posters mounted on the wall. If you wanted your poster placed someplace with a lot of foot traffic where more people were likely to see it, uh, they would charge you more money than if you were in some back corner of the mall where nobody went, nobody would see your poster. Um, and here is another application using um, from uh, this was done by the National Oceanic National Oceanic and Atmospheric Atmospheric Administration NOAA. Uh, that is um, another online resource that you can go to, and you can uh, kind of play around with different uh, quantities and things you might want to examine on a map. So a little bit of theory behind uh, GIS. Um, to know to use GIS, you should at least have a a basic understanding of what are known as datums and projections. So uh, as I think most of us know, uh, the planet Earth is a three-dimensional object. Um, and at least when I was a kid, I'm not sure if it's true anymore, but when I was a kid, uh, in pretty much every school I went to, the classrooms had globes of planet Earth. Um, and looking at these, you might conclude that um, the Earth is a perfectly smooth, spherical object, um, and uh, that's not exactly correct. Um, the Earth is actually a what's referred to as a spheroid, uh, which means basically that it's close to being a sphere, but it's not quite a sphere. 
Uh, so if you were to measure the distance around the Earth going through, going along the equator, you'd find that uh, is somewhat, um, somewhat longer than the circumference of the Earth if you drew a line through the North and the South Pole. So uh, from that perspective, um, you might say that uh, the planet Earth, its shape is somewhat more resembling a tangerine, say, than a navel orange. Uh, and of course, uh, the Earth is not by any means smooth. Um, here in Florida, it's rel relatively flat, so I guess here we come as close to a smooth Earth, Earth as anywhere, but uh, overall, the Earth has lots of contours as shown in this picture. Um, so that's the, the three-dimensional representation of the Earth is what is called a, a datum. Um, but most of us, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, don't look at representations of the Earth in three dimensions. It's much more convenient to look at it, represent it in two dimensions as a flat surface. So on, in say, an atlas, a traditional paper atlas, or on the, or on the screen of a, of a computer, as you're probably doing right now. Um, and because of the simple fact that the Earth is really three-dimensional, um, if you choose to look at it as though it were two-dimensional, you're, you're kind of um, you're kind of kidding yourself, and and you have to make some sort of concessions um, to represent it in that form. And as a result, any two-dimensional, any flat representation of the Earth is um, inherently an approximation. So the process by which you convert the datum, a three-dimensional representation of Earth, to a, um, a two-dimensional representation of Earth is called a projection. And as I said, um, any projection involves making some concessions in terms of accuracy, and those um, inaccuracies can take the can take the uh, the form of uh, the the shape of the bodies represented, the areas that they cover, distance between different uh, geographical features, and the directions between different geographical features. So because of this, uh, you have different projections that are um, basically designed for different purposes, and that try to minimize the uh, the inaccuracies in one of these areas, while um, accepting in inaccuracies in others. Um, so just as an example, um, all, all of the states in the United States have what are known as state plane projections that are designed to represent those individual states as accurately as possible. Um, so in the case of Florida, there are actually three state plane projections. There's one, the east zone, that covers basically the eastern side of the state and just a little bit of the southeastern quadrant, as you can see. There's a west zone that covers most of the uh, west side of the state, and then there's a north zone that uh, basically is the Florida panhandle. Um, and so this is just one example of a projection. There are lots and lots of different kinds of projections. Um, so I mentioned that one of the three basic things that makes up a GIS um, geographic information system is geospatial data. Um, and geospatial data is available from a range of sources. You can get it from government websites. Uh, you can get it from intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations, the World Bank, and more, uh, nonprofit organizations. And every single state in the United States and also the District of Columbia has um, what are known as the state geospatial data clearing houses that uh, just include a ton of geospatial data that um, that in some way, shape, or form relates to the state in question. So, in the case of the state of Florida, that is uh, uh, this website uh, http colon backslash just forward slash forward slash www.fgdl.org and I think that stands for something like Florida Geospatial Data Library. But anyway, that's where you can go. I would encourage you to visit that, explore it, um, all kinds of interesting things to be found there.
And also, if you want to play around with GIS on your own, that's some good data you can kind of start with and just uh, kind of develop your GIS chops with. Um, now, geospatial data can take two basic forms, um, vectors and rasters, which are pictured here. Uh, so to explain those a little bit more, uh, vectors can take the form of points, lines, and polygons. Uh, so in a typical map, um, you might see um, cities or towns represented as points on the map. That's the type of a vector. Um, you might see lines. Those are often used for representing roads or rivers. And you see polygons. So um, you see a map of the United States, those, the outlines of the states, those are polygons. You look at a map of Florida, uh, the counties are shown as polygons. Or if you look at, say, a census map, the individual uh, census zones are also shown as polygons. And um, you know, as I kind of alluded to, those can be used for, um, they can be accurate, accurately used for representing things like buildings and political jurisdictions, real estate bound, boundaries, roads, etc. Uh, they're basically good for non-continuous data. And if you're working on what's becoming a large model, a large GS model, they have the benefit of reducing the amount of disk storage space you need. Uh, rasters are more like the pixels on your computer screen. It's a grid of little squares, basically. Um, and the squares are colored. The colors um, somehow reflect the underlying data, say the value of some sort of underlay, underlying data for that particular little square in your raster. Um, they'll give you a more detailed map, but they also result in higher disk storage requirements. They're good for continu continuous data. Um, and you know, for things that cannot clearly be defined as polygons, don't have sort of clear boundaries, they're good for that kind of thing. Um, and they can support rapid computations and multivariate data. So at this point, this is where I broke away during my, um, during my workshop when I taught it in person and um, sent my students off to do a hands-on exercise. I can't do that with you right now, but if you would like to uh, sort of try to get acquainted with the use of uh, ArcGIS Pro, I would encourage you to contact me. Again, my name is Rob Sipple. I'm the Geospatial and Numeric Data Librarian. Uh, you can email me at rsipple at fit.edu or call me at 321-674-7585. Um, I would be happy to send you the data files I use along with some uh, pretty detailed uh, directions on how to go about doing the hands-on exercise, um, which I hope will be pretty clear to you. And if not, again, just get in touch with me and I will try to steer you through it. So thank you for tuning in today and I hope you have some fun playing around with GIS.